Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay, and welcome to dealmakers.co.uk, the place to find out all about buying a business. Now, would you be interested in knowing what it takes over a 40 year career to buy, build and sell eight businesses? Well, my guest today will tell you exactly how he did it. So Ian, over the last 40 years, you have uh, bought and sold and exited and built and grown eight businesses. So you, you are the true definition of an entrepreneur. So how did it all start 40 years ago? We won't do the entire 40 years, but but how did it all start? How it all started? My first role was as a runner in a dubbing studio. Um, then I wanted to become a film editor, so I was working in Soho, became a film editor, then migrated into a production company, and I was made redundant. Uh, and the film industry goes through ups and up and down cycles. So I wanted to set up my own production company, but I had to get a job. So I got a job delivering paint of all things, driving around London. Again, I was made redundant from that. And at this point, I was thinking, no, I'm getting absolutely hacked off with being made redundant. I'm going to control my own destiny. So I said, that's it. I'm not working for anybody else ever again. Perfect and reason. that's how I set up my own business with the support and help of my mother, working my mum's house, you know, a bit of money from my mum and other bits and pieces. But ultimately got out there and just did the job. Get the old typewriter, writing letters. Oh, I, I um, remember yeah, those days, yeah. yeah. <laughs> going, going down the post office, posting them. And yes. then the fax machine started to come into play. Oh, yes. So that, that's how I got into business. And it, if I go through my history, it, it's predominantly been in media of some form or another. Okay. Whether it's been in video production, uh, AV staging, selling uh, broadcast television equipment, and now in uh, photography and filming. So there's always been a strain of media with a few dips out into property, um, probably in the early 2000s. So, but that's the theme over the last 40 years then? Yes. I think, okay. I, I think it, I've, got this, I've got this conflict between being creative and wanting to be creative, but also being commercially pragmatic and seeing business opportunities. So I'm going to ask you the question that I usually save to the very end, which is what have you learnt over those 40 years of being in business that would be useful to our viewers and listeners? Go with your gut. Absolutely. And if you want to do something, go for it. Find a way to do it. Don't procrastinate. That's, mm. I, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm procrastinating about some things now. And then, yeah, you, you can, because as you get older, you become self reflective and you thought, well, what did I do? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I react that way? Yes. Yeah. What were the causes? And okay, can I address that in future? What lessons? And that's the thing learn from your own lessons. Um, it, it's because some people don't do, do that. They get into a cycle where they don't even realize that they are procrastinating and everyone else can see it. And maybe people are telling them, look, you just keep on putting things off. If you just do it, if you just take action, you'll get a result. But if you don't take any action, you're not going to have any result. Absolutely. I, I'm, there was, there was someone who I did some marketing, I did a marketing mastermind with about seven years ago. And there is always this tendency when you're doing an email or a letter to go through it and read it and make sure it's perf perfect and grammatically correct. And then you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that tomorrow and I'll see if it reads correctly as I'm interpreting. Well, you snooze, you lose. If you, you, someone, you pick up the phone and say, oh, oh, if only I'd got your letter yesterday. I've just given the job to somebody else. Yes. So my view is get it out. It may not be perfect. Some people might not like the fact that things are perfect, but they probably are not really going to be your customers. They're going to find fault in other sure. things you do. So my view is get on and do it. You know, 80% is better than 100%. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, what, what you and I think is perfect, the next person doesn't think is perfect anyway. So it really means not that much. It's about actually taking action and doing it. And, you know, I, I see this all the time in, in dealmakers. The, the people who just get going get the results where the people who are waiting for the perfect business to buy the perfect price the perfect the perfect location um and and they want to tick all these boxes uh, this perfectionism is actually a, 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 an ex an extension of procrastination yeah and uh, is an excuse for not doing something because it's not perfect but at the end of the day you know we're not looking for perfect businesses we're looking for good solid businesses uh, and they never will be perfect but that's not the point are they profitable businesses that's what it's all about so yeah. so let's fast forward then to um 
Uh, your very first acquisition, cast your mind back to that. Tell us a bit about that one. Remind myself, because unfortunately, do, being in business this long, you do tend to forget. Um, my first acquisition was after I'd actually set up three businesses. Um, I It was my third, and it was my first limited company that I'd set up. So we evolved and developed... Um, and it was a it was a, a, a sets and staging business in Kingston, and they were splitting off their business. They they had a, an audiovisual installation division, and they had a set and staging division, and the two were under one company. But one of the the person that was doing the installation did not want the sets and staging business. So during conversations, I said, "Well, I, I'd be interested. I'd be interested to take on the staff." There were about four or five staff, and. I just I do remember the negotiations, but it was it was really quite. I can't remember what took its time. Things take their time because what we were, we were waiting on was the completion of the sale of the other part of yes. the business, which was that was a share purchase, whereas ours was an asset sale. So, so was the other party going to buy everything, and then you were going to carve out? No, the part that no. You I was dealing with the owner who was selling the limited company, but also then selling off the assets and the employees under two P. So I- effectively, I-, I can't remember what the transaction was. I think I actually did the job with the the existing business. I think mm-hmm. the 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 company bought. And they may have done an asset purchase. Actually, I. I do you know what? Sure, it but, it, but, it, but, it, but, it, but I, underst- I understand how how yeah. the two the two pieces yeah. fit, fit together. Uh, so. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the the negotiations for that. Were, were, were they protracted or was it very simple and straightforward? I think it was fairly simple and straightforward. It was the list of assets and I valued the assets. Um, and then it was really a case of just, I think it was on, uh, an essence of I wanted to do an earn out. They wanted a, a, a sum of money. So the, the negoti- negotiations were around how that was going to be So structured. around the terms it, more essentially, than the price. Yeah. More, more than, and ultimately, it was a very low value deal. I think if I recall, it was about 30K. And this, this was back in 1998, I think it was. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few Few months alone. His name is John Andrews and I've got his details right here in my little black book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494 or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. So quite often new deal makers think that it's all about the price and that's where they focus, where the terms, the method by which you pay the price are, as you discovered in this deal, uh, as important and sometimes more important because you can actually give the seller the price they want as long as you get the terms that that you want. Absolutely. So, so tell us what difference that made to you by acquiring that business. And, you know, we understand it was a reasonably modest amount, but that actually doesn't necessarily reflect the impact that a business can have on your on your life and your career. Correct. The it was a strategic acquisition because we were doing we were doing a lot of hire. So hotel would phone us up, oh I'd like an overhead projector, I'd like a slide, I'd like a flip chart. And other people were coming in and doing events and sets and staging in the in the kind of the function rooms. And for us there was the opportunity to go and talk to our clients and say, look, you're using these people. Would you be prepared to recommend us to the people that are coming in? And here is the team. And it, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> here is the team. Here is the creative team that can actually come up with them. the idea, the concept, the set, the staging, and the execution. And we've got the equipment, they've got the technology and the ideas and put it together. And that kind of springboarded us into quite a number of different jobs. And we started to do jobs internationally. Some of the existing clients from within the business as it was, and there, there was a very much a strategic merger um, of mine. It, it stayed, uh, it became all under the one company. It wasn't worth having it as a separate limited company. No. Nowadays, that might have been different, listening to your podcasts about you know SPVs and other things. But at yes. that particular point, it probably wasn't worthwhile. And that didn't cause me any problems. Sure. Um, and actually, it springboarded the opportunity and it enabled us to get to a point where we did a very, very large contract for a very large company. Ultimately, it was Motorola. They weren't our end client. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, it was a kind of exhibition stand contractor. But we had a, the largest job we did was about £350,000. And that was circa 2000. Okay, so so your your £30,000 investment um, paid for itself. Yes. Admirably, shall yes. we say. Yes. Um, you, you raise an interesting point about <clears throat> uh, corporate structure. So, so how how the company or the assets of the company are acquired. And you know, I understand your point that uh, merging into your existing business actually works, worked well and it, it was absolutely fine. Um, but as you know from being on Mastermind, the, the correct way, if we were to do it, t- the textbook way, is to use those special purpose vehicle companies to acquire. Yep. And I, I have to say that um, in uh, Mastermind going forward, I probably will place even more emphasis on this uh, because of a few personal experiences where I've had leases for different properties all in the same company. And with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I should have had those separated out, even even more separation than I actually had in the business, I actually had this extra layer of, uh, of special purpose vehicles for the, for the leases. And... Uh, I think it's a it's a point that um, I'm going to be emphasising even more because it's all about that personal protection. Mm. Um, you can never see around the corner. You never know what the future holds. And if that particular business or that particular part of the business or that particular property starts property as in as in the the property that you occupy that you operate yeah. the business out of, if that ceases working or you have a difficult landlord, I've had difficult yeah. landlords, or the landlord wants to hike up the rent and all, all these different things, you, know, you have layers of protection. But but if you get your corporate structure right, then you can extract the parts that don't work. But likewise, it, you, you can sell the parts that you want to sell, maybe because they have limited value to you, but they have strategic value to someone else. So it's like it's like Lego. Yeah. Everything all fits uh, all fits together, um, but I, I guess you know, ninety eight was that thirty years ago? Was it, th- it was thirty? Uh, 20, right? No, my son's twenty six. So no, so he was born in ninety six. So yeah, 20, 24, 20, 24 years ago. Twenty four. Twenty four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 20, I'm ahead of myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I should have been able to work that out. 20, 20, 24 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, yeah, a lot has changed. In, 20, in 24 years. Yeah. So so you say that first acquisition was the springboard to larger contracts going internationally. What was the development of the business thereafter? Well, oh, we, we hit, uh, if I remember, the Gulf War, early 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember. And that was a significant impact in uh, because airlines stopped traveling. Um, therefore, a lot of international people stopped arriving, events. So I uh, like everything. It all goes in cycles, and we're going through a kind of sort of cycle at the moment. Um, we we rode through that. We had enough cash to see ourselves through. We'd moved into much larger premises in Isleworth, um, kind of a warehouse. So we had kind of our growing business. Um, and then I just got, I think I got to the point that, where is the mm, not really enjoying this anymore? It was mm-hmm. becoming I don't know what what it was that didn't I didn't enjoy, and I actually looked to sell the business, um, and I ended up did did sell the business, and it, I, it was a sale, as you find there are certain people that want to sell just because they want to get out, so you you affect to be selling it at a, a discount. I sold it essentially for balance sheet and a future profit, and I sold it to my old company that I'd sold. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 10 years previously. Yeah. yeah, quite often, actually, people do sell to someone they've had a connection yeah. connection with. Um, it, it is said that if you if you buy a business from someone, the easiest person to sell it to is the person that you bought it from in the in the first yeah, place yeah. because they have this seller's remorse and they think, oh, my life is empty without this business. And then they have the opportunity to buy it back Yeah, uh, is, is quite interesting. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, the best person to buy a business from is a motivated seller. Yep. And that typically that motivation comes from the sorts of things that you've just mentioned. You, know, you don't enjoy it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, there's also uh, stress and ill health and, uh, and, and maybe a lack of confidence in the future. You think, oh, well, yeah, if I lose that contract and that contract, will this business really be viable? I may as well sell it now uh, to someone who doesn't see the same um, downsides or risks that I can see. And then I can get what I want, which is time, freedom, money. Not always top of the list money, but money in there as well. 
and the ability to do something else. Correct. I don't know about you, because I can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> I try and do too many things at the same time. <laughs> right, okay. I, I, I'm the, uh, the epitome of a plate spinner. <laughs> And, then, right, and my right. wife has has a go at me for it. Uh, I, it it's an interesting. It's interesting you brought that up because I, our family had a major traumatic event in the second of January, twenty twenty, and I didn't work in my existing business for six weeks. My wife suffered a brain hemorrhage and she ended up in hospital. And then, of course, she was still in hospital when COVID started happening. Right. And I had a twelve year old daughter as well. And everything. My daughter was just in a final year of university. There was so much going on. At that particular point, I really thought, do you know what, maybe I just need to sell the business because I, I'm not the right person to run this and take it forward. And it just needed that management. But we've moved through that. Um, but even still now, my wife is suffering some of the after okay. effects of it. You know, she's got partial mobility. right? And therefore, there's always this tear between... I want to spend time managing the business, running the business, and I've got goals and ambitions for it, yet I've got my family there, and it's like I, I, you you literally get torn apart. Yes. You feel guilt for not working <laughs> with the business and the staff, and you feel guilt for the family. And it's navigating that. And it's like, sometimes it's like someone comes along and gives you a load of money, but I wouldn't sell the business. Someone did offer me some money for the business, and I said, look, I know I'm not in a great place, but it's worth more than that. So, and I wasn't actively marketing the business. I'd spoken to a friend of mine who had a, 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 an acquirer and I thought, no, I'm not that desperate to sell the business. I, the business is running. It, uh, I, so you've got to, yeah, as you say, the motivation was there. If the right figure had come along, and I, and I've, I remember many, many years ago, and I think I've even mentioned it to you in one of the masterminds, uh, having a figure in mind at all times, if somebody came along and knocked on your door and said, I will give you X for your business. If that figure matches what I would mm -hmm. call your FOF, mm -hmm. I don't know whether to swear, but if it meets that figure... We can work that out, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> go. Just take the money and run. And it's the kind of um, thing to have. And it was always in my mind, but of course that value can affect. Uh, and it, it's interesting at the moment, the way the market is going, because we work with a lot of commercial property and we've had a, a massive amount of work because people want to sell their property, pension funds, because they're forecasting a potential recession, forecasting interest rates were going to rise, and they did. Mm -hmm. And of course, that affects the yield on an investment, therefore they need to dispose of it. And that kind of, a, that whole cycle, so obviously your business, if your business is generating cash, it's worth something, and what else can you do? So how much money would you have to take to put into a deposit to earn the same amount of cash? Mm -hmm. You'd have to have an awful lot of money at low interest mm -hmm. rates. And as the interest rates go up, obviously it's less. But So I've got all those kind of things that go on in my head. But equally, I'm also conflicted because I actually want to grow the business. I'd like to look at some acquisitions, which is why I joined the mastermind because I thought, I do need to grow this. And actually sometimes growing... And I'm looking at strategic acquisitions rather than acquisitions for the sake of, oh, there's a business for sale. Sure. There's something that I can I can understand and know. And then within that, can I get a, some good people within that business that can actually apply their skills into my existing business and you bring the whole thing together? Yes. So I, you often mention uh, Martin Sorrell, for, who set up mm -hmm. WPP. Um, I can't remember what his, S4, I think, is his company. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like a, a an idea where he said, okay, he grew a massive great big advertising agency by strategically acquiring. And actually he acquired many years ago one of our competitors in the broadcast and uh, audiovisual equipment hire business. But it was a strategic one because he's they're, they're creating events. Now I've got the business that actually goes off and delivers the execution. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. my mind, I, I'm looking to acquire strategic fits that are in the media whether that be creation of websites, right, whatever, sure. because we work predominantly in the commercial property market at the moment. That's our that's our main thrust of business. So, one of the other things that really is it is the deal team, and you talk a lot about mm -hmm. deal team. And I think having a good deal team around you, having a good finance person, whether it's a non executive or somebody you've got as a consultant, yes, good lawyer and somebody that's got a good connection uh, with finance, or hopefully a finance person, but having those sounding board, and then eventually as that grows, you can then say, hey, 
I'd love to invite you on to as a maybe as a founder or you you, you know through your special sure, structures. Sure. So let, let's yeah. let's um because there's a, there's a lot of information there really really uh, interesting Ian. So so let's talk about the the exit uh first of all. Um the it's interesting you, you were saying that you're being pulled in different directions. You know, when you're at work, you feel guilty that you're not at home. When you're at home, you feel guilty that you're not at work. <laughs> and uh, maybe you've 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 uh, done what I've done, where you um, you I mean your your twelve year old is twice the age of my six year old. But uh, so I so I'm I'm she's now fifteen. But yeah, right. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm on I'm on the I'm on the on the carpet playing. And at the same time, I'm looking at my emails, <laughs> and yeah. that's when you know that there's a there's a there's some there's some tension there between your two your two worlds. Yeah, uh, and 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 that's also when you have to decide what's actually important to you, because everyone thinks they they need more money than they really do. Every everyone thinks that they they can only ever be happy if they got fifty million or a hundred million. Um, but we do this exercise where we work out. How much money you really need to live a very satisfactory and comfortable life? So we say, you know, ten years of income. You know, what what is this, is a good amount of of annual income? Let's multiply that by ten, and that's your your pot of savings. And then um, uh, paying off your mortgage. That's always an important part to to many mm-hmm. people. And how much does the holiday home cost? Because you probably only really need two homes. You know, I mean, how yeah. much, how many does one person <laughs> really need? Uh, and and then um, uh, look at those 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 uh, items that can be quite chunky in many people's lives, like like school fees. Um, yeah, maybe you need a new car, but yeah, let's 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 face it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even if you went top of the range, um, you know, we're only talking, you know, probably less than a hundred thousand pounds for sort of a for, for a family type sort of person. So so we're not. So when you add it all up, you're probably looking at single digit millions. Mm-hmm. Not at the tens, the twenties, the fifties, the hundreds, and I think it's very important to have a, a very clear goal because then you can work backwards and say, you you can answer the question, how much is enough? Yeah. Rather than it's yeah you know, having this figure in your head that it you know, it's, it's got to be fifty, it's got to be seventy five, and it doesn't have to be because at the end of the day, you know as well as I that our family and the health. Of our family and our own health trumps any cash at bank. Yep, absolutely. You got uh, yeah. It's, I I would pay an awful lot of money for my wife to wind back to yes. the end of twenty nineteen. Yes. Um, it's yeah. You, you're right. There there is the but what it does do it really does make you realise if those events happen, where is where is your income coming from? Uh, and you think, well, what do I need? Okay, well, if I can't work, and unfortunately there are people out there that cannot work and therefore they have no other income. The beauty of being in business is you've got the ability to, I'll use the word passive income, because, but it's never passive, but you you build a business that's generating an income and if you get the right management team yes. in there, they will be able to sustain. So it almost becomes... Uh, a pension, and then if it's spitting out something, it has a value, and you can either say, if it's causing you a headache, right, I'm going to pass this on to somebody else, or I will get somebody in to manage it. So let's talk a little bit about management team, deal team. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, let's start. Let's start with uh, with deal team. Now we all know that you need a very proactive solicitor. Who else would you add to your team? Uh, a finance person, someone that can uh, you can can ask questions but can also maybe because you can build a relationship with a seller and i have a relationship uh that i've had for probably eight years friendly relationship with someone whose business i'm trying to buy but i'm asking certain finance questions and some of them are like i'm uncomfortable why do you need that he's not delivering so so we're talking about someone with an accountancy rather than a finance broker Uh, yes sorry yes absolutely someone who's a, a, a SEMA qualified accountant, Absolutely. someone who looks at management yes. accounts and knows how yes. to analyze the cash flow. Yes. I think that's vital. Um, then, so you, yeah, you've got you've got finance and possibly someone from an operational point of view, especially if it's mm. a specific market that you're going into, you want an expert that understands where the cost savings may be able to be yes. made. Um, and if it's a technology business or a software business, then perhaps someone with an IT understanding. Yeah. Because... People hide a lot of issues in IT. 
I think many I'm sure. businesses have issues in IT. <laughs> they don't tell you them. But I, I think you're you're absolutely spot on with the your your finance person. Yeah. So over the last few years, I've had a a bit of a run of bad luck, which I'd like to say is bad luck. It's probably just bad hirings on on. We've been there. My part. I've been there. Been, been Where there. yeah, I, I've I've had um, uh, I've had. FDs just vanish on me, you know, quite literally just, right. just disappear, just not turn up to not work. Not with money, I hope. Uh, say again? Not with your money, I hope. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I've always remained tightly in control of the, uh, of the bank account. But, they, but if, if, if you don't have a good person on your side running the finances for your existing business and helping you acquire the, the next business then I think you're always going to be on the back foot, especially when it comes to raising money, when you come to, to selling. And there is nothing more frustrating. For example, a situation I remember from last year being presented with a set of management accounts. And I said, right, OK, let's go through this. And he said, well, they might not be accurate. Oh, I said, I don't really want them accurate to the penny. I mean, we're OK. You know, we're, we're, I'm fine if there are a few pence out. Went, well, it could be a bit more than that. So why are we even going to be looking at these management accounts if... They, they might be so way off, I could make the wrong decisions because we could yeah. look at a site and say, this site is making a loss. It might well be making a profit or, and the management account is making a profit, but then you go, oh, well, actually, no, no, if you, if you do that, it's making a loss. Well, why would we even look at them if we don't have confidence in them? And I think you need someone you can have confidence in. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the flip side of that is also, if you're going to go and raise money, then if you've got a cash flow forecast or someone's going to fund the business, a lender will tend to look more favorably on accounts produced by an accountant and say, there is some information, I can validate it. Okay, all oh, right, and they're qualified. Therefore, yes, there's rather more... than sort of homemade Exactly, yep. there's more comfort in the forecast yeah. based on some form of professional yeah. review. That I think that helps. It's not That's not the only reason, but absolutely reviewing finance that's obviously one of the key things. And mm. then, uh, then having um, the uh, the lawyer in the background, someone that can be ready to spring into action. So having a team, uh, obviously you don't need to employ a lawyer, but you, 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 you've, got, you've got one you recommend. Well, yeah, I mean, jo John Andrews, who, um, who, whose firm sponsors this, this uh, podcast, um, I had lunch with him two days ago. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, do you realise, he said, this year, I've done 50 deals for your masterminders. And right. I had no idea. Right. Uh, all, I, I'm sometimes the last person to know that uh, one of my clients yeah. has, has bought a business. Um, and, uh, you know, and I said, so how, how, how can you and your, your team do, do so many deals? He said, because we get on with it. Yeah, we don't, we don't procrastinate, circling back to the start of this yeah. conversation. Um, and we don't get into egotistical battles over things that aren't important. Yeah. Uh, you know, battles with the other side. You know, we, we know what's important, what's not important. We'll stand up for what's important. And, you know, what's not important, hey, let, let, them, let them win on some points. Let them yeah. feel like they've won on something. But at the end of the day, we want to help our client buy a business and get it over the line. And that's the sort of attitude, I think, that, that works. I, absolutely. I, I remember when I bought my existing business, I bought it from the founder, and the founder did not want to engage a solicitor, and I had a solicitor involved in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I do remember the questions coming back to me. Oh, what does this clause mean? What does this clause mean? Well, they were well, the 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 seller of the business. The seller was asking you, asking me, and right. I said, "Well, this is what this is what <laughs> this is a standard clause." I, he said, "A slight well, conflict of interest there, yeah, isn't said, there?" Let <laughs> me get my my solicitor to explain it. But right. really, you should have your exactly. own solicitor. But ultimately, we got the deal done. He didn't get a solicitor, and that's fine. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, there's pros and cons. So, so, so I've bought businesses where there's been no solicitor on the other side, and they basically said, send me something, I'll sign it. Uh, but then it can turn into a nightmare, like you've just described, where they're actually asking you to legally represent yeah. them as well. Uh, the, the, ge the general rule of thumb is, um, is, is someone who isn't represented, who's cutting corners on that. It's probably cut corners in their business as well and can just be a little bit of a nightmare because they can be very unreasonable mm -hmm. whereas a solicitor can say look client you're being very unreasonable just let's get the deal done yeah. uh, and there isn't that sort of pressure on them um, perhaps so uh, so 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 yeah so so actually having the the right people is critical isn't it, it to it, all of this it's vital it's vital it's also a sounding board sometimes you, if you've got <laughs> Am I am I overthinking this? And someone said, No, 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 you're not. And let's actually look at this. 
somebody say, no, I think you'd be fine. It's absolutely. And you mm. can get too wrapped up in the weeds sometimes. And having those external advisors, part of a deal team, absolutely, absolutely helps you clear yes. the path through. Yes, it does. So we're coming up to the end of, of, of our conversation today. And I, I've already asked you this question once, but I'm going to ask uh, you again, but I'm looking for a different answer this time. <laughs> what advice would you give the, the people watching and listening to this um, who are thinking about buying a business but haven't actually taken that first step? You know, they're, they're clearly interested, otherwise they wouldn't be tuning into this. Yeah. But they haven't done anything yet. What would you say to those people? Get on learning. Listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Get on get on your kind of fast track, uh, which is what I initially did, I think, back into 2021. The, the Zoom program. The Zoom yeah. program. Um, then get on to the mastermind or uh, whatever can slice works for them. There are many, many people. They've got a lot of different experiences. You know, some, some are new, some have been employed and have done a deal. You'll know more about those people than I do. But there's a, that, that collective thinking, collective ideas, you know, listening to what happens at the hotel in Richmond, which is where the events I've been to, I think is absolutely vital. Read, learn, digest, ask questions. And obviously one of the other advantages of being once you're in is you get into the LinkedIn group yeah. and you see the questions That's and great, people are like, it, yeah. it, it's superb. And you get lots of people that have done similar deals. You know, people put their experience in. You know, I, I, I posted comments on there, you know, when I feel I've got something of value to add. It's, and it isn't a, oh, you shouldn't have done that. It's like, it's supportive, isn't it? It, it is. It and, is and, supportive. And, I, and I've I've been parts of groups where sometimes the comments are a little bit snipey, or but but we've yeah. got four hundred and thirty people in that group, right. all, all previous masterminders yeah. and current as well, yeah. who who are completely supportive yeah. of each other, aren't they? It's, a, it's a very Absolutely. very good atmosphere in that group. It's, it's very very good. I, I think uh, my view in through life is always be learning. I've always been curious. That's just uh, nature. And it, it's an interesting one because it's never been part of my published values that we've written. And I've, I've actually thought, curious people make progress. You know, why didn't I get that deal? Oh, what good. can I do different? Yeah. Yeah. And being curious, how how can I make that deal work for me? And yeah, that that to me. And I'm always curious oh, really about good. someone else's business. Yes. Why, why are you in the business? How did it work? What, what, what are the good points? What have what you learned? Yeah, yeah, what have yeah. you learned? And you're now selling it. What could I, what would you do if you were in my position? And I think if you can build a relationship with your prospective uh, seller, yes. Yes. and then having the professional people asking the maybe kind of harder questions, as a deal team, you can maintain good cop, bad cop, and you maintain that good relationship. Um, and I think I think that's vital, building that support team. I don't. There's nothing to say that those people aren't. That your deal team might not be other members. There may be other people. That actually, I'm good at this, but I haven't got the time. But yeah, I'm we've, good seen, at this. we've seen a few partnerships yeah. in the group, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I would. Very think. interesting yeah. and a and a great and a great uh, a great endpoint. So um, Ian Leslie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, I look forward to having you back again in the future. Look forward to it.